we're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have to realize that it was communicated by great men, but oftentimes in the scriptures, the readers were not extremely educated or uh, well-versed in the things of scripture, many of the Gentiles. In spite of that, the writers of the New Testament, they didn't dumb down the gospel, but they did explain it clearly. And I think there are some very important points that we have to deal with whenever we're sharing the gospel with anyone. And I say anyone because I have some familiarity with some of the tribes in Peru. I, I didn't live among them, but I, I helped in many areas among the tribes. And people would always ask me, you know, how do you share the gospel with someone in a, a jungle tribe? And I would always say, I don't. I share the gospel with, with a man. And all men are the same. Where I begin the, with the gospel is with the attributes of God. Who is God? You see, sin's not a problem, even for man, unless God is holy and righteous, and He is. So I want people to know who God is, because it's only in light of that, that revelation, that they can know who they are, and they can know how great a crime sin is against Him. And so I will share about the attributes of God. I'll ask someone this question. Do you know God? Or have you ever understood what the Bible says about God? And then, of course, naturally from there, I go to man. And in speaking about man, I began with the general text in Scripture about what the Bible says about all men. And then I try to bring those Scriptures home to the heart of the person with whom I'm speaking. I'm not avoiding their intellect. But my goal is not to win their intellect, but to press the Word of God upon their conscience. Now, we have to share the truth about who man is, but we shouldn't do it gleefully. The person should know that, that we love them, we're concerned for them, and that we know that the truth that we're speaking is a hard truth. Once I feel like the person has come to an understanding of God and man, then I go to the only remedy. I work very hard to use the law not so much to condemn, as much to, uh, to shut the man off, the one I'm speaking to, to any hope in self, so that they only look up for the mercy of God. And that's when I begin to describe what God has done for us in Christ. Now, there are a lot of Christs out there, and they're not all the right one, obviously. And so I want to explain who this magnificent person is, that He's God the Son, that He became a man, that He lived a perfect life. And then I deal with what I always call the greatest problem in the Bible. And when I share that with a person, it, it kind of piques their interest. What am I talking about? And I say, I'm going to share with you the greatest problem in the Bible, what the whole Bible is written about. And it's this one problem. If God is just, He cannot forgive you. The justice of God demands satisfaction. He cannot simply pardon, or he would be corrupt. He would not be just. And so Paul deals with that in Romans 3. How can God be just as he is, and yet justify wicked men? And then we go to the cross. Where on that cross, Christ bore the sin of his people, and was crushed under the wrath of God in their place. And in suffering and dying, he satisfied the demands of God's justice, and made it possible for God to be just and justify wicked men. And then, and I'm not only saying this to the, the ones listening to this video, but I have to say this to myself, I have not preached the gospel until I preach the resurrection. And so I tell them that this Christ has been raised from the dead. And I usually go to Romans 4 and show that it is God's declaration that Christ's sacrifice has fully atoned for the sins of His people. And now Christ sits at the right hand of God. All authority, all power has been given to Him, and He will judge the living and the dead. And so we must now, confronted with this gospel, we must make a decision. We must repent and believe. And then if a person does repent and believe, then I explain to them several things. I give them what I would call gospel warnings. I don't want to leave them there with just, I made a decision, or I believed that day. I show them that if they're truly converted, they will go on with the faith. They will grow. They will still sin. God will not allow them to get away with that sin. He will watch over them as a father. He will discipline them, and they will change. 
But if, if only today they hear the gospel and nothing more, then nothing happened to them on the day they met me or supposedly met Christ.